Ah, Monet. Even in a country as lousy with artists as France, he has secured himself a position as one of the grand masters of painting, even if the fickle winds of public reward were inconsistent in his life. You may know him as the dude who painted meadows and skylines in unexpected colors, but to millions of adoring museum goers, he is a bigger rock star now than at any point in his life. And just like a rock star, his name can be found on every piece of merchandise imaginable. Jewelry, ties, scarves, aprons, stuffed frogs, finger puppets, children's books, prints, pop-up garden models, even the occasional hand-painted reproduction. Experts in the know agree. Monet is money. 2019 saw a new all-time record for most expensive Monet ever sold, $110 million for a version of Haystacks, which had been held in private ownership since its completion. In the art collecting world, pieces by Monet are extremely popular because of their ever-appreciating value and the frequency with which they show up at auction. He is reported to have painted over 2,000 canvases in his life, often working on multiple iterations of the same subject simultaneously to best capture specific moments of light and color. Because the work is so concerned, consistent, it becomes easier for appraisers to value paintings by comparing them to the sale prices of works from the same set. Also, Monet's paintings are gorgeous. Now, we say that about every artist we feature, but Monet, more than most, knew how to convey emotion through the raw medium of color, how to play light against itself in a ballet of feeling. Monet is the strongest argument against photorealism art that can be made. The idea that a painting can depict a subjective impression over a concrete reality was such a fundamental rejection of the artistic trends of the era that even the label Impressionism was first intended as a critique. The paintings were considered incomplete, rudimentary sketches of scenes rather than the fully realized sumptuous visual feasts that they are. Beneath the gardens, the pastoral picnic-ready meadows, the cultivated capitalist exterior beat the heart of an unstoppable revolutionary. Monet and his contemporaries represented such a vast departure from the artistic establishment that when he temporarily relocated to the Netherlands, the police secretly investigated him for political sedition. The man painted landscapes. Did someone confuse them for maps? Credit goes to the indispensable book wizards at the University of Massachusetts Amherst Library's collection, who succeeded in tracking down copies and translations of the actual surveillance notes kept by the police. Today may well be the first time they're ever seen on YouTube, so believe when I tell you that this is a bit of a special episode. Everyone is born a genius. It's what we do with the intervening years that decides if we get to keep the title. Monet's genius first blessed Paris on the 14th of November, 1840. Son of a merchant and singer, it was assumed young Oscar would follow his father into the family's ship channeling business. Fortunately for us, art intervened. Quick primer on obscure naval trivialities. A chandler is basically a petrol station, but for sailboats. Fewer gummy worms and dodgy meat pies, more whale grease and hook hands. It's far from glamorous work. Most of your clients being cutlass wielding, weevil eating privateers, Arr! but it'll buy enough needlessly long bread to feed a family. Anyone born into that kind of guaranteed comfort could count themselves pretty lucky in the 1800s. So of course Monet pursued art with his mind, body, and soul. At the age of 11, he had already established himself as a caricature artist. After his family moved to Normandy, he would sit in the town square with a stack of papers and some charcoal and sell sketches for 10 to 20 francs a pop at the age of, again, 11. His mother believed in her son unconditionally, as mothers are wont to do, but she died when he was barely 16. Rather than bacheloring it up with his blubbermonger of a father, he went to live with his childless widowed aunt. It'd be easy to make jokes about her as a veil-clad mourner swanning through a dusty grey garden-style estate or a whalebone corseted Dickensian governess, but in all seriousness, Monet may owe his life to Marie-Jean Le Cadre. In March of 1861, Monet was drafted into service with Chasseurs d'Afrique, a cavalry group comprised of equal parts French youth and locally recruited North African soldiers. Fun fact, six years before his drafting, they were involved in the famously failed Charge of the Light Brigade, which we'll probably talk about in a future video. Let's pretend you're a wealthy, learned elder of the Chandlering community. The sweat of your brow has purchased your family a comfortable life in an up-and-coming city. Your only son is looking at a seven-year stint of getting shot at in a 
desert that hates him, so naturally you'd use some of your hard-earned money to buy his freedom, right? Well, congratulations, you're a better father than Manet had. Papa Claude refused to spare his son from military service because his son would not renounce art in favor of ship chandlery. So very petty. Imagine seeing your child pursue art almost exclusively for the entirety of their lives, then refusing to spare them from an almost decade-long sentence. Even in the extremely crowded field of terrible fathers of influential artists, Claude Adolphe Monet manages to stand out. Thankfully, genius is never quieted. During the occupation, his skills did not go unnoticed. After sketching some desert landscapes in a bustling marketplace tableau, he was approached to do portraits of officers. Sadly, none of these works survived to the modern age, but it's evident how much of an impact traveling to Algeria had on his appreciation for striking visuals. Here is a biome unlike anything France could ever produce. Sprawling deserts and glittering oases with bazaars full of people in totally new styles and colors of dress. The food. The elaborate North African mosaic tile work. He himself even admitted that all of this contains the gem of my future researches in color and form. However, after two years in cramped garrison, Monet got down with that notorious sickness, typhoid fever. For those of you who've never read Dickens, typhoid can only be spread by consuming the feces or blood of a gross monster who didn't wash their hands. Good thing nothing like that happens in modern times. Monet always died because someone didn't wash their hands at some point between using the bathroom and cooking dinner. Remember that, kids? Don't be the person who almost killed Monet. Wash your filthy hands. Thankfully, rather than let him slowly die on a cot, his aunt Marie-Jean Lacard repetitioned the government to release him early in exchange for attending art lessons. Art school or military service is a question so obvious and straightforward, not even a parliamentarian could weasel their way out of a direct answer, so he graciously accepted. Try not to let this shock you, but on occasion, artists and their models have affairs. Camille Dioncio got to live out that ultimate romance novel fantasy, Muse Wife, to a misunderstood genius who perishes at a tragically beautiful age. She was the model for many of his early works, including Woman in a Green Dress, one of the first pieces to hang in the famous Salon de Paris. In Le Japonaise, she's portrayed as a blonde in a brilliant red kimono holding a fan. This was a satire on a then-contemporary obsession with Japanese art. In what will surely come as a surprise, Camille's parents did not approve of the courtroom marriage between the 25-year-old penniless artist and their 18-year-old daughter. When they had their first child, her parents disowned her. Though Monet had a few gallery showings, money was hard to come by. He once destroyed a canvas rather than let it be seized by creditors. In 1870, war in France drove Monet to England, where he exhibited his work a few times to modest commercial success. With these funds, he was able to relocate his family to Zandam, Holland, in early 1871, the same year that the radical socialist experiment of the Paris Commune was crushed by French government forces. Monet wrote in letters that he was fleeing France out of belief that one of his best friends, a witness at his wedding, had been shot without trial. In reality, the man was tried and sentenced to six months in prison, but either way, any French national traveling abroad was considered a potential political refugee. Seen here are photocopies of the actual telegrammed reports the police sent to the Dutch government. They're fairly brief because it turns out that Monet wasn't a secret radical socialist sent to undermine Dutch society. He was a painter. And he spent most of his time painting. One of the reasons Dutch authorities knew to expect him coming was due to the media reputation Monet had thus far cultivated. He would be interviewed while painting storms or standing on the edge of perilous cliffs. This would pay off years later in 1874 when Monet and Renoir and the other Impressionists held an unjudged gallery exhibition in protest of the stuffy Salon de Paris. Anyone could come off the street and check out the new style, including the infamous impression Sunrise, the work whose disparagement inspired the name Impressionism in the first place. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Returning to Paris in 1872, poverty compelled them to move frequently, and they would come to share a house with his former patrons, Alice and Ernest Hoshid. Also broke, Ernest stayed close to the city for work while Alice lived with the Monets. There were eight children in that house. Even with two women doing all the housework, the economics were grim. The situation went from bad to worse once Camille's health started to fail in 1876. Afflicted with both tuberculosis and uterine cancer, she died slowly over a period of years. In her final moments, Monet painted one of his most controversial works, Camille Monet, upon her deathbed. The work itself is certainly a fitting tribute to the woman who had given Monet so much. Only her face is visible over the bedsheets, but her whole figure seems to be enveloped in this gentle gradient like a veil. The arch of the bed over her recalls the image of an angel's wings. The texture of the face draws the eye to the creases where her arms seem to be folded over her chest, almost like a mummy. 
The priest who administered her last rites also sanctioned the marriage between them, blessing what had started out as a simple civil ceremony those few years ago. Despite having just lost his wife, Manet did not stay single long. He and Alice grew closer. This rampant speculation that their affair started as soon as Camille fell ill, and the press made sport of this, even going so low as to mock the hardworking Ernest, who continued to hustle to support the household while staying in Claude's old studio in Paris. Imagine living that life. Imagine financially supporting an artist, letting him raise your children while you try and restore your family's fortune and good name, only for him to turn around and romance your wife while his own dies. The months after Camille's death would see Monet hone his multiple canvas techniques, switching to a new one every seven minutes. While waiting for the paint on one canvas to dry, he would immediately start work on another, often up to ten or twenty at one time. He is rumored to have once grown so overwhelmed by the scale he was working on that he pitched everything into a river, only to fish it out moments later. So let's talk about what made his work so different. Back then, painting was a messy, space- and labor-intensive process. Artists would stretch their own canvases and make their own paints by grinding pigments into powders and mixing them with oils, things that are much easier to do in a studio rather than on a hillside ten miles away. Because they were painting models in a controlled environment, a lot of art contemporary to Monet feels staged and artificial. Baroque, neoclassical work steeped in Greco-Roman mythology was what the art-buying public wanted. Extremely nude gods wrapped in floating sheets. That's what art was to the young Monet, naked babies flying around the Louvre ceiling. In case you thought I was kidding, Apollo slays Python by Eugene Delacroix represents the absolute epitome of what critics expected of artists at the time. Technically precise, photorealistic depictions of mythological struggles. This particular work was commissioned by Louis XIV, and it depicts a scene from Ovid's work Metamorphosis, where the god Apollo wrestles some snaky finds. The work is rich in metaphor, as you can see everything on the bottom of the painting is dark and evil looking, while everything at the top is shiny and bright very subtle, the perfect subject to pontificate on while holding a snifter of brandy. But why is it important? Putting aside the fact that it's a palace ceiling, the months and years of constant perpetual toil, what impression does this painting leave on you? Where does that feeling come from? Does it come from the high-quality inks, the hours the model spent posing for reference sketches, all the assistants scurrying around Delacroix? Who gets to decide that this matters? Stepping out of the studio, realizing the inability of the imagination to grasp the intricacies of nature was made much easier by a number of technical developments, including the collapsible easel and the Vachet box, a portable container for both paints and small canvases. Suddenly anyone could step out into the light and dash off works of natural genius without needing a small retainer of handmaidens to tote your bags for you. Charles-François de Binny invented a fully stocked floating studio so he could lazily drift down the Seine and paint the shoreline, effortlessly dashing off masterpiece after masterpiece. Because it was suddenly accessible and almost democratized to a point, this led to an explosion in this style of art, and it was this absolute fever for the natural world that Monet stepped into as a young artist. Let's look at Bon à la Grenouillière from 1869, a scene based on a floating restaurant which fellow impressionist Renoir also painted. It depicts a group of bathers resting on a small island next to a restaurant, everything surrounded by water. Rather than being just some placid mirror, the river itself is an active participant in the scene. Instead of trying to recreate the exact images in the water, Monet intersperses the same color of the foliage above with the blue of the water to create the illusion of ripples. Here, the bands denote both the surface and opacity of the water. If you look close enough, you can see the zigzags of color gradually breaking into circular tiger spots, not exactly a recreation of the surface of the water, but an approximation of what it feels like. We are invited to fill in the visual imperfections with our own emotional reaction to the piece. Take a look at how he uses color to give the impression of shadow. We know that this crowd is seated in the shade because of the contrast of the brighter foliage behind them. The light makes it look yellow while the closer leaves are a deep green. The motion of the water throws back more light than the sky above it. You've seen trees wave in the wind before. You instinctively know how to read those blobs of paint as tree. But here's where Monet really earns his accolades. Trace the reflection of the tree in the water below. The trunk wavers. It's even doubled against the leopard spot waves we looked at earlier. The canopy is reduced to dark green echo, the same lopsided circular pattern which becomes the spots and zigzags. This great diversity of brush strokes was something he encouraged other artists to incorporate into their work. You can almost imagine what this place sounds like, heavy with the murmur of conversation, the splash of bathers, and the clink of dishware balancing each other out. 
The late afternoon sun playing off the bushes on the distant shore, the heat of the day now broken as friends recount the weekend's adventures. So now you see what a huge change this was from Delacroix's snake wrangling. You can understand how brave Monet had to be in order to try and compete against neoclassical artists. It looks incomplete. The brush strokes are prominent, and there's an overwhelming vagueness to it all. Neoclassical work feels impressive because this degree of precision requires expensive tools and decades of training. It's the visual equivalent to a palace, an expression of wealth and mastery. Impressionism rejects that. Impressionism tells us that a work matters because it speaks to us and how we see the world. The institution doesn't get to decide what's beautiful. We do. This kind of rebellious streak resonated with the democracy-hungry French public. With his fortunes changing, Manet had the resources to rent and then buy the home, which would eventually become his world-famous residence. By the mid-1890s, he had converted a humble farmhouse into a cutting-edge estate, complete with greenhouse and skylit studio. He hired seven gardeners to help him manage his two-and-a-half-acre garden, issuing daily instructions for the husbanding of his precious lily pads. He went to no small expense to import every color and variety of lily pad that he learned about, encouraging them to create hybrid blossoms in rainbows of hues, blue, yellow, pinks, that aged into a deep red he would have his gardeners overwinter the fragile tropical cultivars in his specially lit greenhouses, then replant them in his pond every spring. So great was Monet's love of water lilies that you can trace a change in his perspective. When he first arrived at Giverny, he would fix the horizon on his Japanese footbridge, but over time the gaze drops lower and lower until the only thing on the canvas is water and lily pads. Here he is in 1899, painting 12 versions of Japanese footbridge. Fast forward to 1916, he started focusing on the shoreline. Here he is with one of his weeping willows, printed out of concern for his son and countrymen fighting in World War I. By 1919, he's but abandoned the sky as nothing more than a blue contrast on the pond's surface. This is a contemplative piece, heavy with the burden of thoughts. At this point, he had outlived both his eldest child, Jean, and his wife, Alice, who passed away in 1914 and 1911, respectively. Alice's daughter, Blanche, took over much of the day-to-day -day management of the estate, inheriting that duty from her late husband, Jean. If you're weirded out by the idea of step-siblings getting married, no, Monet broke up a prior engagement between Blanche and one of his other students. So let's just move on. As if he didn't have enough going wrong in his life, it's during the same time that he begins to develop cataracts. Through the mid-19-teens, up until he had corrective surgery in 1923, his work began to develop a reddish, milky hue. He responded by having his assistants prepare his colors for him, rather than trusting his own perception. For one who loved color, we cannot imagine the immense psychological toll this must have had. Just compare this example from 1907 to the rendition of his footbridge from 1920. You can barely even make out the bridge. It's just a dark cage of red around a riot of red foliage. Contrast that to these lilies that he finished in 1926, and you can see the blues and greens return to the forefront of his work. But there's a fair bit of scholarly study which suggests the operation likely gave Monet the ability to perceive ultraviolet light as a white-blue glow. People want to believe the greats are superhuman, that his special eyesight was what allowed him to paint like he did, but this happened three years before his death of lung cancer. On a list of things that enables genius to flourish, special eyes rank far, far below a partner who manages your domestic affairs for you. Revisiting the theme of women who sacrifice themselves in Monet, we would be remiss not to mention the artistic talent of Blanche Horcher Monet. As mentioned, the Horchers were frequent patrons of Monet, meaning that Blanche had already grown up in an impressionist environment by the time Claude took her under his wing. In fact, she also had started painting at the age of 11 and immediately took to the Impressionist style. The two worked so closely together on some pieces that it can be difficult for experts to discern which hand created which work. Just compare her version of Haystacks with a similar one from that series that sold at auction for all the money in the world. Sadly, managing the family estate took up so much time that she stopped painting for about 30 years. She enabled Monet to focus totally on working through the last decades of his life, but what would Blanche have produced if she was given that same measure of support? The opportunities women gave Monet came at a cost to themselves, their lives, and their ambitions. What adds insult to injury is that the large canvases Monet produced with Blanche's support were underappreciated during Monet's life. 
Even though museums would construct special wings just to display these massive works of heartbreaking beauty side by side as they were intended to be seen, audiences were unmoved. It wasn't until the 1950s, thanks in large part to the charitable estate built by Blanche, that the large canvases were recognized for the immense works of beauty that they were. Manet died at the age of 86. In accordance with his wishes, only 50 of his closest friends attended. One tore off the black around the coffin and draped it in a floral print, a fitting tribute for the color mad genius of the gardens. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.